my name is Siri. My name is Rosalind. And um, we are LARPers, LARP organizers, LARP designers, and kitchen volunteers. Ooh. And it's the last part of that we're going to use. And we actually met in 2013 when we were cooking for the same LARP. And we have a lot of stories about that LARP, but one really good thing that came out of it was that we got to know each other. And uh, since then we have been cooking together a lot and um, also cooking on each other's LARPs a lot. <laughs> Uh, basically, what we are going to do is we are going to talk about different case studies of how we have cooked food and used food cooking and the f f f hello uh, <laughs> food stuff during the games to create a narrative. And it's basically the same stories that's in the article we wrote for the Knutepunkt book. <coughs> so you can sort of just not read the article after you listen to this if you don't want to. Uh, also, all of the examples are examples that we have been a part of, but it's not necessarily our ideas. Um, some of it has come from the organizers, some have come from us. We are just talking about these examples because those are the ones we know, and there's tons of cool stories out there as well. So after this lecture, uh, find us, find each other, and talk about food at LARPs, because we need to talk more about food at LARPs. <laughs> okay, so food. <laughs> um, food is a very important part of our culture. It's tied into who we are and what society we grow up in. Uh, that is the reason why in the Western societies, uh, people find it weird to eat horse or dog or insects, whereas that's totally acceptable in other parts of the world. This means that we have very strong physical and emotional connections to different kinds of food and different kinds of flavors will provoke memories and feelings that are outside of what we consciously want to produce. And we can use that as organizers and kitchen volunteers to create certain feelings. We can play with flavor, texture and the, the aesthetics of the food to create a feeling of different culture or of richness or poverty. Um, right. That was that. Now we are going to talk about <laughs> different examples of that. Will you? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, my first example comes from a Swedish fantasy game uh, called Made in Hesbrand, uh, where I was cooking food together with these two wonderful people. Made in Hesbrand was set in a factory working setting in the medieval times. Uh, the players were either people working at this factory or the people owning the factory which created a very strong division of power and economics during the game, which also was reflected in such things as different cultures, different clothings, and different languages. Now, we were playing the lowest of the low. We wanted to be disgusting, filthy, and sort of, you know, uh, unpredictable, I guess is the word. And we wanted the food to create this feeling of being poor, of having no way out, being tied to this factory where you had to work hard for very little money. And we did this by using a simple technique. Uh, one of them was that we asked the participants before the game started to actively play down the food. We said, please don't talk about the food as nice. Talk about it as disgusting. And we also played characters that were very over the top disgusting, even if we, of course, were sanitary in a hygienic sense when we were dealing with the food. Uh, we also served food in two different kinds, uh, based on color. It was called mushes, because it was mostly just a mush with no texture to it. It was sort of like gooey and porridgey with lumps in it. We had a green mush which was a lentil stew with a lot of garlic and olive oil, which was very nutritious and heavy, so you got very full of it. And we had a yellow mush, which was a rich potato mush with a mushroom sauce mixed into it. Uh, funny side note is that at one point, one of the participants took a scoop of the yellow mush, expecting it to be wild because it looked really horrible, and couldn't help but going, oh my god because it was so tasty. And then she had to sort of like save it by going like, that was different. Uh, and it became a part of creating this image, this feeling of being in a place where you're stuck. Of course, some people can have a problem with different textures. So we also added a lot of uh, side dishes, like 
uh, cabbages and bacon and that sort of thing. So those who really couldn't stomach the mush still had something they could eat. <coughs> yes. Uh, our next very, very different example comes from a LARP called Once Upon a Time. Uh, it is a LARP um, based on the TV series Once Upon a Time and the graphic novel Fables. And it's about uh, fairy tale characters who have been forced to flee from their homes in the fairy tale land and ended up in the real world. And uh, LARP takes place, the setting is uh, sort of a commemoration of the day when they had to flee from their homes. So all of these fairy tale characters who now live in the real world gets together to commemorate. And uh, we had a few uh, directly food related meta techniques on this game. For example, the poisoned apples. And when you ate a, poi a poisoned apple, you fell into a deep, deep sleep from which you could only be awoken by true love's kiss. And then you had to find that true love, which wasn't always so easy. <laughs> and uh, we also wanted to create a feeling of stepping straight into a fairy tale. And one uh, tool we used to do that was that we recreated the Mad Hatter's Tea Party from Alice in Wonderland. So we did this over-the-top tea table with nice tablecloth and decorations and flowery teapots and lots and lots of cookies. And this, this did not only set the mood, uh, it also worked great as a playing area and as a chance for the players to fill up on energy in the form of sugar and caffeine. <laughs> and this also meant that one of the tasks that we uh, as organizers and our helpers spent the most amount of time on before the game was baking and decorating the cookies. We sat like night before the game, I think we were like seven, eight people who just were decorating these cookies with this sugar pasty thing. And um, <laughs> I could also add that the cookies on the picture are both gluten free and vegan. Because <laughs> we're sweets. <laughs> okay. Um, anything more? No? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, our last example of how to uh, literally use food to create a feeling or a narrative uh, comes from the LARP Beyond the Barricades, uh, which was run uh, last summer. Uh, it's set in 1832 in Paris during one of the failed French revolutions. And as the name uh, sort of suggests, it's set beyond a barricade. So the players were playing revolutionaries from different social statuses who had all come together, formed a barricade, and was trying to hold it for as long as possible where, while the Parisian military and police were fighting them. Uh, we wanted the food to sort of really create a French feeling because we were really in a forest in Sweden, and that's not very Parisian. Um, so we served uh, French farm stews and uh, onion soup. We also wanted the food to give them the feeling of uh, being in a situation where things got more and more dire. So what we would do was that we were cooking the food outside of the barricade and then the kitchen helpers would carry it in in buckets and serve it and then people could go and get their food. Now, an interesting thing that happened that we didn't really plan on was that since people were playing uh, revolutionaries from the top society to the bottom of the lowest, it actually became a marker of what kind of social status the different characters had. Some of the most poor characters were super happy about the fact that they got food all the time, whereas some of the richer characters were complaining about how lacking the food was in nutrition and vari variation. We also made sure to talk loudly outside of the barricade about how our, our transports had been shut off and how therefore all we had to serve them was like literally nothing. We only have onions left. And uh, then the next day they got onion soup. So it actually, so we went through with it. Okay, so, so we, we had meetings with the organizers, the food volunteers and the NPCs about how to get the narrative structures working. Uh, basically, uh, the letters were from other barricades, uh, which started off very happy and going like, yeah, we're going to do this together, awesome, and gradually turned into, we are dying, it's only three of us left, please let your dead bodies be the wall between us and them, if you fall, we all fall. Then we had the NPCs coming in playing 
uh, characters from other barricades as well. So obviously, if we had sent in a letter saying that things were going well, then they also had to behave in, in that exact way. And of course, we had to tie into the actual narrative of the LARP, so the whole story made sense together. It also created interesting and cool scenes when these foods uh, were opened up and they found letters. And of course, at one point you had to go in and remove bread because they weren't cutting into the right one. So we had to make sure that only the letter breads were left inside until they opened it so we could continue on with the plot line. Yeah. So, uh, moving on from the food uh, to the kitchen the kitchen staff and the kitchen as a playing area. Uh, every LARP that offers food to their players needs someone who cooks the food. And unless you have a completely external actor who does that, that needs to be volunteers or organizers. And these people have a huge responsibility in making sure that the food is something that everyone can eat, that it is enough for everyone, uh, hopefully nutritionists enough for people to have the energy to keep on playing. Uh, it has to be on time and so on and so on. Uh, but that, that, this not, does not mean that the kitchen staff and the kitchen cannot be a part of the game. Of course, when you have this much of game responsibility, you should never get involved in the game to an extent where you, it actually interferes with the cooking. We have seen that happen too. It's not fun. Um, but there are many ways that you could include the kitchen and the kitchen staff in the game uh, in a way that not only makes them a natural part of the setting, but actually enhances it and makes, uh, makes it better and introduces new, new elements. And we will now present a few ways that we have been doing this as kitchen volunteers. Yeah. The first example comes from a game called Coven. Uh, this was a LARP inspired by American Horror Story, the season called Coven. And uh, the LARP was about a coven of witches. Um, and it was supposed to have, kind of feel like an hor a horror movie and to have this creepy, airy feeling throughout the whole game. And it started out with a new group of witch witches arriving to this coven. And these were teenagers who, um, uh, just found out that they were witches and that a magical community at all existed. Uh, so they were new and scared and confused. And one way, uh, one tool that we used to create this feeling of this coven being really, really scary and weird was the household stuff. The household stuff was not only the kitchen stuff, it was also the organizers and volunteers who had other primary tasks than cooking. And we played some kind of ageless, emotionless, maybe not even human characters who were just a part of this place. Uh, so apart from doing chores like cooking, serving the food, uh, cleaning uh, the houses and people's rooms, folding the players' stuff neatly when they were out doing other things, assisting in magical rituals and so on. We also spend a lot of time just doing scary stuff. Uh, we could stand in the kitchen window, as she does in the picture, and just stare out from it for a long, long period of time. We're talking could, like 15, 20 minutes just staring. Yeah. It was creepy. We could <laughs> sweep the same flop, spot on the floor over and over and over again. Uh, at one of the runs, we did two runs of this, uh, we listened to the same song on repeat throughout the whole game. <laughs> I still have a very weird relationship to that song. <laughs> um, and uh, this was really played up by the characters, just as um, in the example with the Made in Husband food. Uh, the characters and the players actually, I think they scared each other with stories about the household stuff just as much as we, as we scared them with our actions on the, in the LARP. And uh, it worked out really, really well. And uh, yeah, really enhanced the experience of this place being scary and creepy and not normal. 
Okay, we go from uh, urban fantasy witches to uh, oppression and penalism at boarding schools. <laughs> uh, some of you might have heard about Lindingen Boarding School, which is a Swedish LARP about penalism. It's actually on the first run of Lindingen that me and Rosalind met uh, when we were in the same kitchen staff. And since then, uh, either Rosalind or I have cooked at every single run so far. It's going to Denmark soon, and we hope that we will be able to <laughs> sneak into the kitchen then too. Have the <laughs> so here is some uh, input on how we have done it before. Um, the setting is, as I said, a rich boarding school. It's uh, based on true stories from these kind of boarding schools that uh, exist in the Scandinavian countries. Uh, which other are countries as well. Yeah, other countries as yeah. well, of course. Um, which are plagued by stories of penalism, uh, young people doing horrible things to each other in the name of tradition and honor. And uh, it has, as I said, had three different runs with three very different kinds of kitchens, and I will try to go through the differences of these kitchens quickly and what that made uh, as an impact on the actual gameplay. Uh, in the first version, we were the socialistic kitchen, uh, whereas uh, the rest were all upper class people, basically. Uh, we were the sort of working class uh, anti-heroes in the kitchen area. Uh, we created a kitchen that was a safe zone for those who were the most targeted by penalism at the school. So we said in the beginning that whenever your character feel they need a safe space, the kitchen is that safe space. There will still be game going on there, but we will not be oppressive towards you, but supportive. Uh, this meant that we had runs of uh, young children, well, <clears throat> I mean like adult <laughs> LARPers, but it's hard to see them that way after a while, coming into our kitchen uh, with very scared eyes looking for something frozen to put on their different bruises. At one point we had run out of peas and spinach and had to give them frozen scones. Uh, <laughs> We also became involved in the plotline of the LARP when uh, one of the penalistic situations went overboard and one of the kitchen staff called a journalist. And an NPC playing the journalist came in and did an um, a article about the school. At the run number two, we went a different path. Uh, there the kitchen was a more upholder of the same traditions as the rest of the school. Uh, even if we still weren't upper class in the same way as the students of the school, uh, we were there as professionals. We had matching aprons and hats and we were very strict and, and presented a unified front towards the children. Uh, however, we were also f uh, function within the game. So, for example, uh, the student council could send uh, children who were misbehaving to the kitchen to do penalties. And then these upper class kids would have to uh, clean the, the pipes and uh, do the dishes and we would talk loudly about how fucked up everyone were at the school. And that way they got like a reflection of what the normal Swedish society would think about what was going on within the frames of the school structure. And for the third one, uh, we left it very much up to the participants to decide how they wanted to use the kitchen. Once again, there was a class divide because the kitchen staff is obviously not going to be the upper creme de la creme of society. Uh, and in this run, the students, or the players I should say, decided that it would be uh, forbidden to fraternize or talk with the kitchen staff at all. This didn't mean that we weren't a part of their experience, rather the opposite, I would say. Uh, of course, we did the simple things like talking very loudly about all the gossips we ever heard with the windows open and with the students studying outside the windows, but that's like child's play. You know how to do that. Now, we were doing other things as well. And that was all on the account of what they were asking for. So, for example, at one point, uh, one of the organizers and one of the players comes into our kitchen of game and they're sort of like a little bit giggly and then they go like, sorry, do you have any cheese? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, <laughs> says Rosaline, because she is a very skilled uh, volunteer for kitchens and so she also, she knows how to have enough yeah. cheese, yeah. Oh, great, because, you know, um, we, we would like some, if that's okay with you. Uh, yeah, sure. Why? Oh, we're baking a hat. Excuse me? <laughs> yeah, we're baking a cheese hat, because we have a rat in our class, and we need it for the penalty. 
okay. <laughs> and then we bake the cheese hat. Uh, we also uh, made uh, cupcakes on demand to one of the teachers that was used in a psychological test, which in its <laughs> own ended up creating a whole side plot, which we won't go into now because war stories aren't really that funny when you weren't there yourself. But, but you can point, read about it in articles. Yes, you can read about it in the article. <laughs> and the point is that food became a crucial part of the power structures within the school. And that was because the fact that uh, Alma and Mimi, the organizers, had made sure that there were enough people in the kitchen so that when one of the players comes and says, oh, I would really need some cupcakes, we had enough staff so that one could say, actually, I'm not really doing anything right now. I can make some cupcakes. And that wouldn't have been possible if it had been too few of us there. And uh, yeah. yeah, our last example is more about how to use the kitchen as an area rather than the kitchen stuff. Uh, it comes from a LARP called Sigis Dotter, uh, which is set in a modern day matriarchy. Uh, it uses what we would call gender roles from maybe like 50s, 60s, but reversed. So in this world, the women are the providers of the family and the men are the stay at home wives or husbands in this case. And um, this meant that the kitchen, which is uh, traditionally seen as the women's domain, now became the men's domain and safe space and uh, somewhere that, that the male characters could be uh, away from their wives a bit and talk to each other um, and so on. About like important men stuff, like children and yeah. like cleaning and such. Stupid stuff. Yes. And even though we were in charge of the kitchen off game, um, the men could still come in and they helped, helped to cook, they baked, they um, did the dishes and so on, uh, as well as uh, playing and using this as their domain and their safe space. And um, this created a bit of an interesting situation for us uh, because we didn't want to interfere too much with their game. Since we are women and played women in the game as well, uh, we kind of didn't want to meddle with their affairs when they were doing stuff in the kitchen. Uh, so at one point when they were preparing uh, a meal or they were baking cookies, I had to ask the male organizer to go around and make sure that they had thought about all the allergies because I didn't want to do that because then I would have like disrupted the power dynamics of the kitchen. And uh, we also used this the kitchen especially to play up some stereotypical gender roles. I mean, we were in charge of the cooking in-game as well, but we were real chefs. I mean, these men were probably good at cooking for their family, but we were professionals. And uh, uh, at one point, we had fixed the drain under the sink, <laughs> and we had no idea what to do. <laughs> but we sat down, we started looking at the pipes and going, oh, let's screw this this way and see what happens. And I, not only, I don't only have prejudice here, I know for a fact that there was a lot of men in the kitchen at the time who knew exactly how to fix this. Um, but they did not um, interfere with that. They did not offer their help. They kept on baking their cookies. And once we had managed to fix it, which we did after a while, then they started talking about, oh, how lucky they were to have women who could do the hard and dirty work that they would never know how to do. <laughs> <laughs> so it created a really interesting and um, kind of a cool situation in a game that is about these stereotypical gender roles. Right. I think that's the uh, end of our case studies. And now we're moving into our little tips and tricks session. And after that, we were hoping to have a little open floor discussion where people can talk about their own experience from cooking LARPs. So uh, we have some tips and tricks. Uh, do not poison your players is uh, our first tip. Um, this, of course, happens. Um, People have allergies, you might not always have them in mind, but at least do whatever you can to make sure that that doesn't happen. And uh, also, uh, don't run out of food unless you planned to run out of food. Um, there is no one saying that you have to provide the players with enough food to keep them full for the whole time the game is going on. But unless you tell them that 
there will not be enough food for you, so you have to think of that by yourself, or you have to be prepared that you will be starving off-game as in-game. Uh, you need to make sure that the, no one is starving. And the last one is don't understaff your kitchen. And this goes back to the stories from uh, Lin Dengen that we were talking about earlier. If you have enough people working in the kitchen, uh, you have the leeway to create things, go with the flow, which is what LARP is about, really, to be able to facilitate all these different stories and situations. Also, then you have uh, the room to, you know, improvise if someone gets sick or uh, of some other reason can't work. Um, how many? Or am I talking for you now? No? Uh, no, you yes. do that part and then I do that part. Oh. And then we'll fix this. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, however, uh, what the good amount of people in a food group is will vary a lot. Um, and you have to think as an organizer, how am I headhunting these people? Um, we know from our own experience that me and Usalin can do the same work together as maybe five people who never met each other before. Because we have worked with each other so much that we know how the other person works and we can divide our labor in a way that is functional for us. But if we are working with people we never worked with before, we need to negotiate that all the time, make sure that people are taking care of themselves and that everyone is feeling okay. So you have to think about how are you going about finding these volunteers? Are you going to ask one person to create their own team? Are you creating a team for them? There's no right and wrong here, but you have to take into consideration that that might change how many people you need in the kitchen group. Yeah, I think that was. And uh, oh, papers. <laughs> uh, we would like to encourage you, or those of you who are organizers and game designers, to put some thought into how the food and the kitchen uh, can be used to improve your game. Because it is something that will require a lot of time and energy for you or for your kitchen volunteers and a big part of the budget. Uh, so you might as well use it uh, to make your game better, because it has to be there anyway if you are going to provide food. And also, our most important point, if you're going to forget everything else that we have said and remember one thing, we want you to remember this. <laughs> communicate. It is so important that you as an organizer make sure that you communicate to your players how much food is included, <coughs> what kind of food is included, um, so they know what they will get to eat during the LARP. Uh, a lot of the times, once the players have arrived to the location, they have no chance of getting their own food. Uh, so if they, at that point, discover that they won't be able to get enough to eat during the game, that could have really devastating consequences for their overall game experience. Uh, and of course, you as an organizer can decide what kind of food you will serve at your game. If you want to only serve one kind of food and not take any consideration to special diets, that's okay. You can decide that you want to serve bacon for lunch, breakfast and dinner, and nothing else, and that's okay. If you tell your players before that this is what will happen, so they know that when they decide whether they want to go to your game or not. It is not okay, and this happens a lot. Yes. It's not okay as an organizer to receive signups with special diet requirements, not say anything about it, take in a full participation fee, and then when the player arrives to the location, then you tell them that, oh no, we won't cook for you. And of course, it's also the player's responsibility to make sure that the organizer and the kitchen staff knows what they can and cannot eat. But that's another discussion. We have rants about that too. Yes. We could take that we another time. We can rant all night about that if you want yeah. to. Um, <laughs> so yeah, if you're going to remember only one thing, we hope that you remember everything, but if you're going to remember only one thing from my lecture, it's this. And just to end it on a little more positive note, here are some things you should do as an organizer. And it is, as you see, clearly communicate with your players and uh, to appreciate your kitchen staff, uh, to show them that they are an important part of what you are doing. And lastly, uh, which is also a completely <laughs> own rant that you also can get if you want to, uh, work with any special diets instead of against it. If you have a participant who really can't eat any gluten, do you really need to serve pasta or can you serve potatoes instead? It will make it so much easier for you if you can include the special diets into the or normal food. 
because otherwise you end up with like six separate pots and everyone will be confused. The players as well, because yeah. they won't know what to eat. So our best tips is probably, if possible, do not set the menu until you have the list of the participations. Yeah. Okay, so yes, question. Just comment to the last there. That's a safety issue also. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you're working, Definitely. you have something with severe allergies, you have to have a separate and clean station in the kitchen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And most large kitchens aren't really that good. Yeah. Uh, what? <clears throat> If you do not have uh, the possibility to predict uh, what will be the allergies or other, what are the safe uh, kind of food that you can serve and be sure that anybody can, anyone can eat? There is no such food. There is no. Sorry. Uh, you could do a few things. Uh, actually, this might come as a surprise, but vegan food. Yay! <laughs> and, uh, Mostly because that eliminates a lot. Vegan food is okay for vegetarians or anyone who doesn't eat animal products, uh, and it also uh, doesn't contain any lactose. Uh, so that's an easy way. Of course, there are people who cannot eat completely vegan for different reasons. We know that. Uh, but it's an easy way to eliminate the problems with some of the most uh, common, in our experience, allergies and special diets. Can you name some of these? I mean, like, I, 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 I see, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, like, I would say also it depends, of course, of the setting of the LARP you're making. If we're thinking medieval, historically correct food, it will be different things than if you're thinking modern life. Uh, but generally, anything, if you take away wheat, so you don't have any and gluten, uh, so it's not only wheat, it's all of the kind of produce that contains gluten and lactose. And then uh, stay away from peanuts because that can kill people. <laughs> uh, and then, since you are staying away from peanuts, just stay away from nuts in general. And then I think like citrus fruits also can be kind of touchy because a lot of people have a citrus allergy. So if you take those away, then you have a sort of safe base to work around. And then you can start to experiment and try to facilitate people who, for example, can't eat vegetarian or can't eat uh, other kind of starches. Yeah. So to ask the same question, can you give us a solution instead of uh, advice? Which vegan dish will you advise us to make for our vegan players? Uh, if it's a oh, that's vegan <laughs> player, uh, for what kind of LARP? <laughs> it doesn't matter, we eat off game. What kind of food should I make? Whatever you yeah. want, lentil but stew. Uh, uh, you can make roast vegetables. I mean, like, yeah. generally, uh, I think people get really afraid when you, they hear the word vegan or vegetarian because they think it sounds really complicated. But it's generally just take whatever meat dish you are planning to serve and substitute the meat with lentils, beans or vegan vegetarian meat substitutes. Or another uh, idea could be to make some kind of base that everyone can eat. Like make a soup based on some kind of vegetable, any vegetable, and then have a lot of different side things to it. And then you can actually provide for almost anyone and you don't have to make sure that you put all the things into that soup. So if you have a soup that everyone can eat and then meat eaters can put bacon on it and uh, vegans or people who prefer that can put like lentils or chickpeas on it. And so that's a really good idea to accommodate for a lot of different people uh, with the same kind of dish. I think we have, okay, I, I'm going to start to do a list. Um, uh, so we have one, two, three, four, five. Is that okay for everyone? Yeah. And also, uh, we don't have that much time left. Uh, we have a few minutes, but this is also like one of our favorite subjects. So just grab us if we don't have time to answer all the questions. Grab us during the, yeah. Yeah, the weekend. Uh, did yes. you have an I order? Have a yes, one. okay. So um, one thing that you definitely can do is when you have people with a uh, vegan or vegetarian or something, you cannot rely on just, oh, well, then they will eat from the salad bar and that's fine. Uh, and then, you know, have the, the traditional uh, food cooked meal and, and, the, and salad bar on the side, because that does not work uh, nutritious-wise. Uh, you need to make special dishes for mm. yeah, uh, vegan dishes. Yeah, everyone needs to get... Yeah. Yeah. Mm. 
the, yeah, the aim should be that everyone gets like the same quality of their food, no matter their preferences. Two. So I would just also uh, specify something which is really important when you, especially when you decide food, is count calories. Make sure that the food you are serving contains enough calories. There are more stories where that did not happen. So I think calories a day on the sign for a week is not optimal. Unless you clearly <laughs> communicate yes. that. Yes, that you yes. Know. That's the point that you yeah. have the sign for this, or people who made the food who didn't actually check the calories. Right, mm. yeah. So, yeah, good point. Very good. Calories are important. So, going back to the game design part of the, of the cooking, I guess. Yep. Um, I've been, in some of the games that I've organized, we've had uh, player characters cooking food. Mm -hmm. um, and, and usually we would have one helper or npc ish person who would be in charge of, of running the kitchen, but the players would cook in order for, for the players to have something to do during the game, but also to have uh, the preparation of the food and the culture that's going on around that as an integral part of the story. Could you comment on what you did at the one game? You had one example of doing that. Right? Sigrid Stotter. Yeah. Um, should I? Or should um, you're the organizer. Yeah. So you, you um, <laughs> okay. Oh, I yeah, just, I'm I sorry. So much I assume not. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, but I think that like uh, what we did there, they didn't uh, have any like you have to cook. Uh, but uh, we were saying like if you want to at any point in the game, come in and help. And we weren't co counting on it, so we were prepared to do everything ourselves. Mm -hmm but we were giving the option to them. Uh, when it came to the dishes, uh, both for that and also for It's a Man's World, which was a LARP that I ran uh, a while ago, so everything needed to be done by hand. And so we said that doing the dishes after every meal will be a part of the game. And so the family units were asked at Sigrid's daughter to have one dinner or lunch that they were doing the dishes for. However, we said to the players that if you choose to, you can have only the men doing the dishes, but it is your family unit that are uh, responsible for this happening. And this created a lot of interesting play. For example, the first day in game at Sigrid's Daughter is sort of like Mother's Day, but Father's Day. And so we had like uh, a father standing there with his son doing a lot of dishes, and then his daughter comes in and sort of like, oh, don't worry, Dad, I'll help you. It's Father's Day after all. And then she moved two cups, and then she left again. And then he could rave on about how nice it was that his daughter came and helped him on Father's Day. So it became a way of game. So that's like the two different approaches, I would say. With yeah. the cooking, we said, it's an option. With the dishes, we said, you had to. And we also had one meal during the previous run, uh, which was completely organized by the players. Uh, but that was some kind of a Swedish fika, which, which is um, <laughs> coffee and cookies, basically. Yeah. And uh, that was um, one of the players. One of the players' initiative. Yeah. Um, so then they, they did all the planning, they did all the baking. We bought some stuff and made sure that they did things everyone could eat. Uh, but they organized it completely. Uh, but that wasn't, it wasn't breakfast, lunch or dinner. It wasn't one of the like crucial meals. It was more of something that was a nice thing to have in the game. I, I also wanted to sort of talk about how you've been using the food with narratives. I, I, think, I think what you've been doing has been really amazing. Um, I, I'm really fascinated because I think there's, there's much more to explore in this. Um, I, I write games with food as well, and I've been using sort of ingredients to inspire characters, cool. to inspire relationships between characters as well. And then, so I, I'm, I'm just sort of fascinated that you can use food both in that kind of non diegetic way to kind of you know create world relationships and, and everything, and you were you were using it in a much more diegetic way mm -hmm. to inspire things. Um, yeah, I don't have a question. I just want to no. put it out there. Well, really interesting. Yeah, would love to talk more about that. Uh, I'm just going to check the time. <laughs> Uh, okay, we have two minutes, so one starter. You already answered to this question. The question okay. is if in your, in your experience you use a kitchen entirely run by players, and if not, why? Yeah. Okay. Because I think it leads to a very, very good appreciation of kitchen stuff. Because mm -hmm. yeah. we use that in a, in, a, in a play we run, in a lab we run, and, and other players were very grateful and uh, mm -hmm. full of love towards other players yeah. <laughs> that cook, because if someone is cooking for you, he has to love you in a way. 
Yeah. yeah. We have a micro rant about that as well. <laughs> uh, we have uh, only room for one more, and that's Saren. I'm sorry. Uh, but please find us and yeah. talk to us anyway. Yeah. I would uh, uh, provide an example if that's okay. Um, a a game that, that I co organized a few years ago about an occupation um, of a country. Um, we had uh, we have the, the occupiers uh, distribute emergency rations for. Uh, for the local players, mm -hmm. uh, and that was sort of the basic uh, food, the vegetables and the lentils and stuff. Um, and then we made sure that we made some other food so that they wouldn't starve if it didn't work. Uh, and we told the players that need, this needs to work. But we also made them hand out the rations in a way that that meant that there would be conflict about that. So, so we created a whole set of, of cultural norms around how food is distributed that the soldiers then wouldn't really follow, so that that would turn into a conflict point between the two uh, between the two cultures. Cool. Wow. Well, it's two o'clock. Thank you so much for listening to us. And as I said, or we said, uh, <laughs> yeah. Talk about food. It's good.